Mr. Mulberry. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father God, we thank you for allowing us to arrive here safely, for allowing us this opportunity to look to your word, to come to a better understanding of your word, and as a result, to draw closer to you, have a better relationship with you. We pray that you guide our hearts and minds during this time. We pray that you help us to always understand your word better. And we pray that you please forgive us of any sins that we have committed. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So today we'll start looking at this topic, um, addressing non-believers. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, uh, the goal is just to, I, I don't have a, an exact schedule, I have an outline. And so we can spend a little bit more time if there's war if it war if it's warranted. If not, we'll go quicker. And so the pacing will pretty much be determined uh, by you. Uh, today, we'll, I'm going to talk a lot about some personal beliefs that I've held in my own journey, and uh, that we talked. Uh, about maybe there being some benefit to that. And so we'll do that today. And I invite you to feel free to ask any questions that you may have. Uh, it's a good opportunity to ask someone who didn't believe why, what did you believe? Why did you believe this way uh, to challenge any of the beliefs? Uh, feel free. I will not be offended, and I will try to respond as best I can the way I would have during that time, because I think it could be educational, and hopefully you'll see you'll see why. But uh, if you have any questions or you want to challenge any of the beliefs and just see what I might have responded, uh, I again I think it it could be productive. Uh, I'll let you determine that. All right. So during this, what I want to address, one, is non-believers. Uh, you know, often we think atheists. We a lot of times ignore agnostics. And we shouldn't. And so I want to separate those out. Uh, we'll talk about what that means. Uh, Non-Christian religions. Uh, what would be included in non-Christian religions? Mormons? Um, no, no, they're going to come up next. <laughs> uh, Buddhist? Buddhist? Hindu? Hindu? Yeah. Yes. Islam? Islam, absolutely. Uh, Judaism? Yes. We often don't think about that as being a non Christian religion because they were the precursors, but they do not believe that Jesus is the Christ, that the Christ has come. Uh, so those as well as Christian denominations, and that would be uh, you know, Mormons, that would be uh, Jehovah Witness, Catholic, also are, we often, because they are so large and dominant, we don't think of them as a denomination, but they are an offshoot of that original belief. And anything that is an offshoot would be a, a denomination. Now, the thing is, all of these are under the term non-believers. So when we think of non-believers, oftentimes we go right to atheists. And we don't think of all of these as non-believers. Uh, how are Christian denominations non-believers? They believe in God. They believe in Christ. Yes. Well, they have their own uh, set of beliefs that they come up with, their set of rules and hierarchy of um, the leadership. And they make their own consuls and... Yes, absolutely. They have their own set
set of criteria. Now, uh, when I talk about Christian denominations versus the, the church, I'm not talking just what says Church of Christ on, on the building. Uh, this is, I know, something that's difficult to accept for some people, but you may have the church that doesn't say Church of Christ on the building. Why would that be? Yes. They have their own identity. Uh, yeah, well, there's that. I mean, but I'm I'm talking those that would actually be following the truth. Yes. But this in the scriptures we read many names that were used for the for the church. Indeed. Indeed. And keep in mind, Church of Christ makes sense in English. In other languages, it's obviously not going to say. Church of Christ. Now, it will be something that largely has the same meaning, right? But it's still not saying the same thing. These other names that you see in the Bible that are legitimately used for the church. Yeah, I know some will assert that anything else is, is wrong, but if it's a biblical scriptural name used for the church, we can't conclude that. So what would determine whether something is actually the church? Yes. If you find it in scriptures, like the church at Ephesus. Right. Church of Christ. Brother Wright. I'm sitting here and stop you what he said. Um, the source of authority and you may follow um, a charismatic leader, for example, rather than the Bible. And Brother Skull. Same with yeah. that. All right, so our measure is going to be measure them against the scripture, right? That's basically the sum of what was being said, is you're going to weigh what they are teaching, what they are doing against what the Bible has to say. That's it. That's our only measure. We can't come up with some litmus test of our own the Bible is our test, and that's how you know someone's following the scripture. They don't have some other set of doctrine that they're following, no other body that's that's governing them. It is they're governing governed by Christ through this work. And so any place we go into, if they have the name Church of Christ, Iglesia de Cristo, any other church of God, anything that you might see in the scripture. You go in, and if their teaching is according to God's word, where you're okay. If their teaching is not according to God's word, then that is not a place to be. Even if they have the right name, if they're not teaching according to scripture, that's not the place for you. Brother Scott. Yeah, it, and it's, uh, you see so many, church, uh, so many groups, you know, in, in, in making that title. You know, making putting for that name on the building, that name that they're going to market, that name that people are going to be talking about, you know, to share, to like come, you know, first thing, you know, somebody asks, you know, hey, come to church with me. Well, what, is, what kind of church is it? Well, it's a Christian church. Well, what's the name of it? Mm -hmm. You know, what's it called? You know, they don't want to be dragged into a temple of, you know, this and this and everything because everybody's Christian. Yeah. Right. And so it's valid, it's a valid question. And so many congregations, so many groups kind of um, sell out with that, you know, and they'll just, you know, that's what's going to be a pop, what's going to be, you know, the broadest, you know, type of thing to where we, and it's just about, you know, it's not about accuracy, it's about marketing. And it's about, you know, a, po a popular name or a, a catchy name, or it's a this or this, you know, like I've asked people that have gone down to Mariner's Church, you know, it's a huge church, you know, or Saddleback Church, or, you know, Harvest Church, you know, and you have these very broad names, and really what it comes down to is who's the preacher, who's the pastor, who's the this, you know, who's the leader, is he on the radio, has he written books, has this, and it just gets crazy. It has nothing to do with the Bible. It has nothing to do right. with accuracy. It has nothing. It's it's almost exploitation, in a sense, to just 
get people involved in something you know they're, that they're not even sure of. And then you get in there, and it's such a broad definition about doctrine. It's like you can't get any direct answers. So yeah, think, you you have to investigate. Absolutely. You have to investigate. I've gone to many churches of Christ, and I've walked out of a few. And because that what they're doing is not what I see in the scripture. I walked out of one years ago, and, and one of the elders stopped me on the way out and asked if there was anything wrong. And I told him, I, look, I'm not trying to tell you what you can and cannot do here, but this just isn't according to what I understand in the scripture. And he didn't believe what they were in what they were doing either, he shared with me. So that was that was news to me, but that was the case. You know, it was nice to have have at least a little exchange to for me to even hear that. But you know, I determined I'm not going to stay somewhere where if, if I'm going to worship God now. If I'm going to, to take the gospel somewhere, I'll go anywhere. If you're a Baptist church or Church of Satan, I'll go. And if if you invite me to preach the gospel, I'll I'll come. That's that's not a problem for me. But if I'm going to worship, then I want to worship according to the Bible, not according to some marketing uh, scheme to to get me through the door, brother Scott. Uh, and real quick, you know, just as far as that investigation thing. So it's so true. There's a church down on Ball Road and it's called the Church at Anaheim. And I'm going, wow. You know, there it is. I go in and I'm reading all the materials in it. And they're talking about crystallization and you know and all of this uh, uh, mystic stuff about you know and medical uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Can I ask you any questions? I'm good. Like it's, I mean, it is a church. It's not the church <laughs> as we've identified it in the scripture. So, you know, anyone can apply the name church, like we talked about with the uh, the concept of the word synagogue. It was, a, it meant assembly. And it didn't exclusively mean an assembly of Jews. So the Bible sometimes will specify where there was a synagogue of the Jews because that's specific. So, you know, we have to do our due diligence. Don't get too comfortable with just a name. Now, the name is important. I'm sure I've given this analogy before. If, uh, it used to be long ago, everybody had their, their names outside their houses, uh, right? And so if you went, you were looking for my house and you saw the name Alan Wright outside the door. It's nothing wrong with that house, but that's, you're going to just conclude that, well, that's not the right one, right? That's not the one to, to look for me. That's not my house, right? It's just obvious. But you get to one that says, Daryl, you might think, well, that could be it, but it may not. There are many Daryls in the world. If you see one that says Daryl Deon Hawkins, you'll say, certainly that's the one. Knock on the door, my son answers the door. Oh, that's not the right house. So, so even if it has exactly the name you're looking for, it may not be the right one. You ultimately are going to have to make that determination. So the name is important, but it's not the end. It's just the beginning of some of the research you need to do. So uh, these are non-believers. And, you know, then there's all sorts of things that you can ask about, you know, crystallization, uh, Wiccan and things of that nature. Uh, you know, you can categorize them sometimes in, the realm of atheists or agnostic or uh, non-Christian religions, depending upon their particular view. Some believe in gods. Those are religions. Uh, some don't believe in God. And so those would be more closely aligned to uh, atheists. So, you know, we don't want to make a too broad a list here. 
but generally they'll fall into one of these categories. So the other thing I want to I'm going to talk about a little bit is science. Now, I'm not going to try to teach a, a hardcore science class, uh, but when you have people who don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in in in, uh, in Christianity, then a lot of times they'll say, well, I believe in, you know, the science when it comes to certain elements. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. How much we talk, again, will depend on your, your interests. Uh, but it's important that we learn how to address those particular concerns that people have. Um, so specifically, I'll talk a little bit about the scientific process, and there's a reason for it, you'll see. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about physics, cosmology. Cosmology is the, the science of researching the origins of the universe. And the Big Bang Theory, of course, many of you are familiar with. Uh, the theory of evolution, Darwinism. These are contentious things. Carbon dating, because I think we need to have at least a rudimentary understanding of what carbon dating is when people say it. And sometimes I hear Christians say, I don't believe in carbon dating. That's not really a, a great response. So having a little bit of an understanding about it can, I think, help you in addressing people. Uh, prehistory, this is one that's very interesting to me, and we'll see why as we get to that. And this is new. I've taught uh, on all of these other topics before, um, but I do, I'm going to mention AI, and there's a reason for that as well. And so we'll get there kind of down the road. Um, but all of these aren't for the purpose of making scientists out of you. Uh, or maybe having you become experts in any of these fields. It's just an idea. The idea is to give you a, a bit of an understanding of each of these points because they're relevant when talking to certain non-believers. Now, if you have enough of an understanding to maybe respond well enough, uh, if, if a person does want to go further into that topic, then my recommendation is to take them to someone who is versed in these areas so that they can have that conversation. Uh, and, that, and there are people in the church that you can do that with. Uh, I'm always happy to talk. You guys might be surprised, but I'll talk as long as people want to talk. <laughs> so, and I, I continue to stay up on oh, the latest theories. So, uh, talking about agnostics and atheists first and specifically agnostics the definition a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of god or of anything beyond material phenomena a person who claims neither faith nor disbelief in god this is my particular uh, belief it was my particular belief coming up uh, I would have phrased it in this way. God can neither be proven nor disproven and is therefore irrelevant in our day-to-day -day lives. So that's what I came up believing. Yes? I've heard some people say, oh, the universe, you know, they believe in, uh, is that, is that different than being an, an agnostic? They go, oh, well, the universe decided that I had to do this, or... Yeah, so sometimes that's just being used as a, you know, it's not like a, it's a particular entity believed in. It's just being used in to say, you know, oh, the, the universe had other ideas for me. It's more hyperbole. And in other cases, it's people that actually believe in nature and mother nature and the universe, almost like there is a, a, larger force and but they it's not necessarily the christian religion or 
or Christianity. It's not necessarily the God of the Bible or anything of that nature. There are a lot of people who do identify as religious, but with no affiliation to any organized religion. That is a huge movement. When we see a lot of people leaving the church, a lot of people leaving Christianity, denominationalism, but people also leaving the church, a lot of times it's to pursue something that is no organized religion. So they can believe within their own heart, whether it be the Bible, whether it not be the Bible, but they don't want anything to do with anything organized. And so I, it's hard to say because it's, you know, it's not a, it's not a single thing there, but you do hear it a lot among people who uh, don't profess to be part of some organized religion. And that allows you, of course, the liberty to, to do things that aren't in the Bible. I'm going to use the, the uh, words phenomena there, beyond material phenomena. Uh, an interesting <laughs> statement was made to me by my grand, my daughter-in-law. They lived in, they lived in Texas where the, the thing Monday was a big deal. I mean, the, the sun was actually completely closed over them for four and a half minutes. And she made the statement, well, I'm telling you, if God can do that on here, there's no telling what he can do in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> and that just that just struck me because it wasn't a phenomenon; it was it was nature, you know. Yeah, nature. that's it's a it's a natural okay. process. However, even that there there is a connection to God, but we know there's a system that's going on. Okay, and understanding that as Christians can be very helpful when man is predicting that there's going to be a, a eclipse based on calculations, not based on prophecy. He's based on calculations. That shows you there's a natural process when it happens exactly at the time that that was calculated. It's a process. But again, God is not invisible in that process. We'll, we'll uh, try to talk about that a little bit later. But just know the the difference between some of these things so that we can talk intelligently to two people uh, yes I heard one on that you know somebody said oh it was such a spiritual uh, event for me so they relay the I guess it goes with what you were saying with taking nature as a god you know as mm -hmm. a, a spiritual being force around them and sometimes we throw that word around without it meaning anything like what the Bible has to say. Um, but a friend of mine was talking about it. He, he uh, got to see it with his, his young children, and that was, that was great. He's a member of the church, and he was talking about how people would have reacted to that long ago, the sun suddenly going dark. And it would feel like if... if you didn't know what was going on, it would feel like something magical, right? Some Something frightening, right? For the this uh, documentation of a battle that was actually about uh, 480 years ago that was actually stopped because of a, of a total solar eclipse. Because, and both sides you know, saw the sun being blocked out and knew that what they were doing was not what God wanted them to do, so they just stopped. And they went back to their countries because they saw this thing, and they said, this is obviously God telling us we need to like rethink this. It'd be nice if it straightened a lot of us out. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Anything that can get us to reevaluate what it is we think uh, is important, which takes me to the next idea. So... That is what an agnostic would be, believe. That this idea, we can't know anything uh, beyond the material phenomena. Meaning, basically, when when we talk about science, you're talking about physical sciences, something that requires some physical evidence of something. And so, if if you can't 
provide physical evidence, you can't prove it. I can't provide you physical evidence of God. Now, I know, you know, we will look at, uh, well, look around and see the trees and, and the like. But the Bible doesn't paint that in, in the picture of saying, this is going to tell you the nature of God. What it's going to do is get you to question. And if you question, you will find. If you seek God, you will find him. So that's what those are for. But ultimately, the only way we know about God is through his word. You are not going to look at nature and say, you know, God has a plan for me, and this is the plan. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You're not going to come to that by just looking around. You're only going to come to that through, through scripture. So that's the contrast with, with this idea of being able to physically prove God. Uh, I realized early on, you're not going to physically prove God, but I didn't believe you could disprove him either. So I couldn't say there is no God. So my personal history, this one's, it's weird. This is the first time I've really talked about it as a class type of thing. It's very strange, but I did not believe and obey the gospel until I was 22 years old. Uh, many in the church find my story interesting. However, I find this, my story very mundane. The reason a lot of people in the church find it interesting is the church doesn't interact a lot with people who are agnostic. A lot of times we're trying to reach other people who already believe in something as opposed to those that don't believe. Me, I interacted with many people who believe the same way that I do. So to me, it's mundane, but to other people, they found that interesting. And uh, this has really driven a lot of my teaching. You, Many of you have heard my teachings over the years. I keep emphasizing that we need to not only try to reach those who are in the various denominations and teach the truth, but we need to teach non-believers. And I've been saying that now for you know, pretty much as long as I've been baptized. Is That's a person, uh, these are people that we need to reach out to as well. The reason we don't reach out to people in, that, in, in this realm is because it's unfamiliar and uncomfortable. We know the Bible, and if you at least believe part of what we have to say, then it's comfortable to have that discussion, debate, what have you. But to go outside of that is very uncomfortable. We need to get outside of that comfort zone because these are souls that need to be saved. And they're not going to be saved unless we expose them to the truth, which means that we may have to do some extra work. The world is going to continue to go further and further in this direction. It's not some magical prediction that I'm making. That's just the trend we see. And so we're going to have to go get people. Brother Scott. Yeah, and you know, conversations I've had with people, I find it much easier to get a conversation going about stuff like that, about spiritual things, with somebody that might be an agnostic or anything, just because they're very passionate about their, their position, you know, most of them. And uh, talking to somebody from another denomination, they're very resistant. They don't want to hear a lot about how their worship might be flawed or their you know, king pastor might be telling them, you know, something that is not biblical and they just want to hear it. They just want to hear it. So I, I think it's, you know, I think it's much more profitable as far as the kingdom goes to, you know, to, to try to reach people outside of the faith. I, I agree with that. And like I said, that's one of the reasons I don't find my own story very interesting. The biggest difference is Exposure, I think, and exposure in the right way, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But I do believe that there's a world out there that you can engage in conversation. They're not going to necessarily agree with you right off. I didn't. But you can engage them in conversation, and that's what we want. And there's a lot of people who will tell you with whatever denomination they're involved, I'm good. I know, you know, I know who God is. I, I know I'm in the right relationship with God. And, and so you can't, 
if you can't have the conversation, you can't persuade people. It doesn't mean you give up. It just means you've got to at least keep looking for an opening to engage in conversation. Whereas there are people out there who don't believe who will willingly uh, engage you in conversation. In all arrogance, engage you in conversation. That's okay. Because all we care about is that they're willing to talk. So me, as a child, I was raised in a Baptist family. Uh, some of my extended family members were very involved in the church. Uh, deacons, you know, ushers in the Baptist church, or uh, some preached in the, in the Baptist church. So there was a, a, a lot of involvement from extended family. However, my immediate family didn't regularly attend church. We went during Easter and wore the Easter suit. Mine was always a hand-me-down because uh, I have a brother that's two years older. He got the new suit. I got the old suit. It was new to me. Uh, and we went and everybody talked about what everybody was wearing. And that's, that's what I remember from the experience. And people, because I was a child, you know, they felt free to talk about things that maybe they shouldn't. And so they talked bad about somebody. Oh, look at what they're wearing. Look at this person's wearing. And that's, that's what the church was to me. It was a, fashion show, people talked good about what certain people were wearing, and your, the measure of who you were was how good you looked. Did you have Easter eggs and that kind of thing? Yeah, they hid Easter eggs and all sorts of things, but, you know, as far as if you ask me, what did I learn about God? Nothing. So, and in my own household, there wasn't a great deal of discussion about religion. So coming up, I knew very little about God. Uh, now, it will surprise you how little I knew. And I want to really emphasize that to you, because if you encounter someone who's similar to me, everyone's got their own story. You know, you're not, everybody's not going to follow my mold. But you may assume some working knowledge of the Bible. Mary is uh, the uh, mother, and and uh, I wouldn't know that. Mary and Joseph, who are they? It was a question on Jeopardy, and I could win a bunch of money by answering it. I would have lost the money. I, I don't know. People up the street, I did not know. Now. That may sound absurd because I know I've talked to people who could not believe that I knew that little. I knew that little. That's just the way it is. So we can't always assume a certain amount of knowledge from people when we talk with them. Yes. I remember when I left Catholic Church and went and was looking for a little more Bible you know, based thing. I found myself in a Lutheran church in my mid 30s. And I, I was single, and we had, and they had a rally, they had a car rally, and the clues were going to give you direction for Bible questions. The first question, the first question I got up to the top of this hill, and there was a T intersection. Goes turn right if the 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 uh, the story of Noah was in the Old Testament. Turn if it was in the New Testament. I didn't know which way to go. Going home. Yeah. yeah, I was in the children's Bible on the bookshelf somewhere. <laughs> you know, it's it it, it 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 will do us well to just remember. Everybody might have different levels of exposure, and it may be shockingly low. It doesn't help though to point out just how surprised you are that a person doesn't know anything about the Bible. If they don't know anything about the Bible, what do you do? If someone doesn't know about the Bible, what do you do? <laughs> Teach them. That's it. That's it. Wherever they are, whatever they know, that's, that gives you a, a, a starting point. And sometimes a blank slate is better. <laughs> 
it's hard to unlearn things. It's it's easier to learn something than it is to unlearn and relearn something. Uh, Sister Beard. When someone in your family was asked what they were religiously, what was their did they answer Baptist? Baptist. Yes, to Did this your day. Father and mother have a history in the church. Uh, it, just, like I said, it made a couple times a year we went. But before they they start a family, were they interested in religion at all? I mean, I wouldn't know. That's a good about, question. They didn't talk about their past when they were growing up. No, not not in terms of religion. That's a good question. I'm now curious. Now, now you're. <laughs> Yes. We can learn from children in my class this year. One little girl came with a book, a children's Bible. And she came to me and she said, Mrs. Wright, can I put this in my book class and read it during workshop, during their independent work time? I said, Oh, most definitely, honey. And this boy goes, What's a Bible? And she goes, You don't know. And he goes, No. Why well, don't you read it here? And I'm like, Oh, my heart, you know, it's like so. So children, you really learn about from children. And we have to make sure we teach our children. Yeah. You know, that's, if, if we don't want our children to grow up not knowing what a Bible is, you need to teach them. Um, I encourage young parents to give their children a Bible at a young age. Don't worry about the fact that they may tear pages. You can buy a new Bible. That's not what's important. And you'll be surprised when you give a child a Bible that's theirs. They actually start to cherish that. It, it becomes something important. And if you open your Bible, it's funny. Your child will open their Bible. So there was a, a lot of, you see a lot of mimicry that goes on with children. And so they can mimic good behavior. One of the things I do miss about having songbooks that we use regularly as opposed to on the board, not saying it's wrong, but one of the things children would often do is pick up a songbook. Ashton would pick up a songbook and hold it upside down because we're holding a songbook. She would sing, she'd learn some of the songs, but hadn't learned to read yet. That mimicry is good behavior, it's good teaching. And so, you know, things we see there, prayerfully as we have children to pass them on to, and grandchildren and, and the like, those are the things we're passing on, the importance of exposure at a young age. But whether or not it's there, teaching will have to happen. So that was, that was me as a child in high school, personally believe mainly in rational scientific theories. That is that is what I looked for. Uh, so I believed in the Big Bang Theory. I believed in the theory of evolution because they were rational scientific theories. That's important to understand. They are rational. Rational doesn't mean they're correct. It just means they come from somewhere. They're believable, they're based upon something, there is a process to arriving to them. So when, when, when we look at some of these, sometimes we want to just say, you know, that's complete and utter foolishness. You're never going to win anybody that way. Understand, they came to understand this and believe this based upon a process. What you need to do is show them an alternative. That's the beginning. So most of my schoolmates actually believed in God. I came up in a, a fairly mixed area, but largely a Latino black community. Um, the, there were people who were white or Asian. They tended to be the poor side of, of it. Because, and I mentioned that because later on I would be bused to the segregated schools where all the money was. It was a very big difference uh, because when I was bused to a segregated school to, for desegregation, I was segregated because the only people I knew were all black that got on a bus and went to the school 
So we were the only ones who knew each other. And it's the first time in my life I was segregated. Whereas when I was in my home school, I was around people of every nationality because nobody cared. <laughs> so, um, uh, but one of the things you do see a lot of times with lower income is more reliance on God. It's just the reality. And so I knew people who were members of the Church of God. One of my good friends, she was a member of the Church of God, and she would always confront me on, why don't I believe? But would never give me a reason to believe. And you know, her, her view of evangelism was, confront. it was very confrontational. Well, you should believe. Okay. Well, how can you not believe? Well, I don't. Well, you have to have faith. Don't have faith. You've got to be willing to go further than that. You've got to give people a reason to believe. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's got to drive us. We've got to understand what that means. If you encounter somebody who has it, doesn't have faith, what does that passage tell us? They haven't had the word. That's what we've got to provide. It's, it's not the end of the conversation. It's the beginning. It's an opening. So the Church of God was very relevant. I knew members of the Church of Christ. I wouldn't know this until many years later after I was baptized and, and would attend a church in that area every time I'd visit my parents. And there were some of the families I went to school with. A couple of biggest bullies in the school sitting <laughs> right there in the, in the church. They were Christians. They were Christians. So, you know, the, that's the other issue is I didn't necessarily have a great view of the church, you know, great perspective. Uh, because people didn't seem to live according to what they spoke. And also a lot of Catholic in, in the area I grew up in. So there was a basic respect for churches. I, one of the things that, you know, when I was in Santa Ana, there was a, a lot of break-ins at the church that, uh, that we attended there. And I had commented once that, you know, and when I was growing up, no one messed with churches. <laughs> Even if you didn't believe, you didn't bother churches. You, you, people might break into a store. They might steal a car. They might do a whole lot of things. But the churches were left alone. And we're in an era now, leave the doors open on this place and see what happens. There isn't that basic respect anymore. So it's, it's interesting. Um, in college, I was given a Bible for the first time. That is not a good statement. <laughs> it's good that it happened, but it's not a good statement that it would go that long. So the child at least that had an opportunity to ask, what is a Bible? That's, that's good. It's something we miss. You want to help convert people and help them to come to an understanding of the truth? One of the things you can do is give them a Bible. We'll give them tracts. We'll give them talkings. But we don't give them the actual word of God. Look, there is nothing that I can say that is better than God's word. That's just the truth. Now, I can be a guide, but there's nothing that I can say that is better than God's word. So that's a very basic, fundamental thing we should do. So I was given my first Bible. I read the Bible for the first time, and I did not understand the Bible for the first time. That's important as well, because I didn't have a guide. So it would be some time before I came to understand the Bible. At least the journey started. I mean, for me, it's, it's easy. Give me a book, I'll read it. I just, 
That's what books are for. And the Bible wasn't some special book that I approached. It was just, it's a book. It had words. I'm going to read it. So as an adult, I met a preacher, a preacher by the name of Graylin Freeman out in Santa Ana at the time. And he was interesting. He was willing to discuss anything I wanted to discuss. He's never dismissive. He'd sit down and we'd talk. Where now, there were other... What was the, uh, where, where was the church that you got? Fifth and Harbor. It was the West Side Church of Christ okay. on so Fifth and Harbor. Away from, hmm? away from the center of town. Yes, yes. Uh, but not, you know, not a great area. Um, but we'd he'd sit and talk and, and just was willing to discuss matters. Now, there were things that you could try to talk to other preachers about, and they were they didn't want to talk about them. And he'd entertain whatever it is that I wanted to say and talk about and questions that I had. But the thing is, the difference is, when you have somebody who's willing to listen, you're also willing to listen to them. And so that's what I did. I listened to him. And we talked and we talked and, you know, the he, he tried to answer whatever questions I had. Sometimes he'd say, I don't know. I respect people who say, I don't know. I don't really respect people who try to bluff their way through it. Because, you know, it's better to just say you don't know something. Maybe it's something you can learn by going back to the scripture. Or maybe it's something God hasn't revealed to us. You make him look. Either, whatever it is, don't lie to people. They're going to know you're lying. And that's not going to help anything. My goal was to challenge biblical principles. You know, I, I like debating. So if you want to have this discussion, I sat with him and we debate. I challenged his ideas. And he took that in stride. We talked sometimes. I think I mentioned Coco's threw us out <laughs> two o'clock in the morning because we sat and we talked about the Bible. But all the while I was learning. We're discussing and I'm learning. And so I came to believe and was baptized. So the question a lot of times people ask is what led me to believe? And I think we're going to have to leave that. Is that a cliffhanger? Yes. <laughs> it wasn't planned that way, but it seems like it. <laughs> You'll have to tune in next week uh, to get an answer to that question. We're uh, toward the end. The question is, what led me to believe? Um, so, yeah, we won't, won't even start down that road because that's a that's a long discussion, and we're at the end of our time. Any any questions right now, though? Responses, statements? Like I said, if, if you want to, next week we'll talk about some of the things I believe specifically and what led me to believe the Bible. But if there's anything that you want to ask right now, go ahead. All right. Feel free to come with your questions next week. Feel free to have questions. Like I said, you don't always get an opportunity to ask someone and know that they will not be offended no matter what you ask. So feel free. This is a good time to ask whatever might be on your mind about some of these uh, subjects. When we practice, when we play around with some of the, the things that we might ask and or challenge, it's, it's good practice for us so that Later on, we'll feel comfortable with what to say and maybe what not to say, what, what to say in a little different way. Yes? Just real quick, I'm sure when you had that conversation when you were there so late at the Cocos and everything, it's because you were doing a lot of talking and you doing a lot of listening to it. And, you know, and that's, I think that's so important. It is very important to sit and listen to what a person says. When you try to act from a script, when you just ignore what they say and then give them a scripture, it doesn't, doesn't help. It, you can tell. You're just now talking at somebody. 
But if you're responding to someone, it's usually connected with something that they have, have to say. And I can tell you that that was absolutely instrumental in me obeying the truth. Just before getting into the details, if it weren't someone who would listen to what I had to say in a respectful manner and respond to the things that I had to say, I would never have listened to what they have to say. And if I didn't listen to what they had to say, I wouldn't have come to a better understanding of the Bible and I would not be here today. That's the reality. So listening is absolutely key for us. It doesn't mean we believe everything someone tells us. It just means, though, that we treat them with the respect that we want to be treated. And that's the only way we're going to get the word across. All right. We're going to go ahead and let Brother Wright lead us in our songs. Can we get a songbook, please? And open to number 576. 576. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle there that night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe and veil below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is a victory, oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph from. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, swept on our every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, run up in dread array, let tents of easy left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about. The truth shall tremble neath our tread, and echo with a shout. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. The next hymn is 302. 302. No me. Blessed be he the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Before our Father's throne, we pour our love our fears, our hopes, our rays are one, our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual hopes, our mutual burdens bear. And often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. When we asunder 
upon. It gives us sinward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. I believe Brother Dean has our closing word of prayer. <clears throat> Please pray with me. Our Father God, we thank you for having provided us with this opportunity to examine your word, examine ways that we can become more effective in carrying out your word. We pray that you please guide us as we strive to be effective ministers of your truth, effectively carrying your word to all those who will, will hear in carrying out your mission as a result. We pray that you be with us as we go our separate ways. Please watch over us and protect us. Allow us to arrive at our destinations. Allow us to return here again at the next opportunity, the next appointed time. Please forgive us of any sins we have committed. It's in Jesus' name and by his authority that we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for